Greetings, Shalom world viewers. My name is Father Thomas Steinke, and I'm an associate pastor of Our Lady of Peace Parish in Santa Clara, California. The third Sunday of Advent has been called Gaudete Sunday ever since the time of Pope St. Gregory the Great in the sixth century. It's the reason that the priest wears rose-colored vestments. The word Gaudete in Latin means rejoice. The liturgy for every Mass begins with a short verse from the Bible called the Entrance Antiphon. That verse can also be substituted by him. But in the official liturgical books, every Mass begins with an Entrance Antiphon. The Entrance Antiphon for the Mass on Gaudete Sunday is Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Indeed, the Lord is near. So why is the Church inviting all believers to rejoice at the midpoint of Advent? Because Christ coming to earth, which Advent anticipates, is the only source of true, lasting joy. Many people, perhaps the majority of the world, are being deceived about what leads to happiness. And one of the chief sources of deception is the primacy in seeking pleasure over joy. So today I want to talk about the difference between worldly pleasures and spiritual joys. First, what are they? Intellectual or spiritual pleasures are what produces joy, something of the mind and heart. Physical pleasures, on the other hand, are lo located in a particular part of the body. Delicious food delights the taste buds and nothing else. They are caused by some material thing, food, drink, fragrance, color, sexual contact, etc. Conversely, joy is not restricted to any one body area. Rather, it's something that accompanies the general well-being of a person as a person. Sometimes it's linked to physical pleasure. In this sense, joy arises from the intellectual appreciation of what we sense. So the music of Mozart or the sight of the Grand Canyon are examples. It is a product that emanates from our two highest faculties, the mind and the will. Some more examples of things that cause joy are a brilliant idea, or an excellent book or movie. And even deeper joy, though, can be felt when we are morally good, when we are kind and generous, for example. In other words, whenever we perform acts of charity, to do what is right before God may be difficult at times, but it leads to peace and joy. These are two of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So the holier one becomes, the more joyful and the more at peace one should be. The deepest joy is felt not only when one feels love, but even more fundamentally when one loves, which entails sacrificing one's life for others. So Pope St. John Paul II said again and again in, in many of his encyclicals that man will only find himself in a sincere gift of self. So pleasures are very superficial and limited in duration. My philosophy instructor used to always say that the first bite of food tastes best and each subsequent bite produces increasingly diminishing returns. And if you attempt to overextend the pleasures, you feel disgusted. So perhaps some of you have had the feeling that after a big holiday meal, too much pumpkin pie is not only unhealthy, it can lead one to displeasure at the very moment when one is eating. Joy, on the other hand, springs from beauty, truth, and goodness. It flows from the deepest desires of the human heart because joy is not dependent on any material things. It can never be taken away or even directly diminished by someone else. And this is what Jesus means when he speaks about the joy no one will take from you. It never leads to satiety or to disgust. One cannot experience too much truth, love, or beauty. The saint doesn't need anything extrinsic to be happy. He literally has God in his soul and that suffices. That's why Blessed John Henry Newman says, the Christian has a deep, silent, hidden peace, which the world sees not. He is the greater part of his time by himself, and when he is in solitude, that is his real state. Left to himself and to his God, that is his true life. So joy is actually good for one's health, whereas a surplus of pleasures, especially sensual pleasures, damages the health. The worth the sin, the more devastating the effect. When the death of 129 porn stars over a period of roughly 20 years were analyzed, 
it was discovered that porn stars experienced an unusually large number of premature death from such causes as drugs, suicide, murder, alcohol abuse, accidental death, and disease. When the death ages of these porn stars were averaged, it was discovered that the average life expectancy of a porn star is only 37.43 years, whereas the average life expectancy of an American is 78.1 years. On two different websites, the average age uh, of death of a rock singer was 36.9 years and 42 years, respectively. The one with 36.9 years listed all the stars and the cause of death. Of 321 deaths listed, 49 were by drug or alcohol overdose, and another 36 by suicide. That's over 25% of the causes of death. An incredible statistic, unless Satan can really destroy people. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll literally kills people. So Aristotle said long ago that we should watch out for pleasure. He said that we can easily get carried away with things that, and, and that pleasure is the cause of it. So recent research is providing us with more details about how pleasure rapidly causes vices to develop. It shows that the effect of pleasure in forming habits even extends to strong physiological impulses especially in the form of a rush of dopamine, and that's a physiological cause of pleasure. And this causes us to want to repeat the behavior. The studies show that at first, when we start developing a habit of experiencing some type of pleasure, if something better is presented to us, we can choose it. But once the craving becomes so intense, we no longer consider the more reasonable choice, but automatically seek the pleasure we are accustomed to. Interestingly, as the habit becomes ingrained, this huge neurological spike, this blast of dopamine, happens as soon as someone is in an environment to receive the pleasure, and that's what Catholics call the occasion of sin. This is when it becomes extremely difficult to go against these physiological impulses, and that's how a vice or addiction is a form. Moreover, there's something called the Coolidge effect, basically, it means to get the same intense experience, we need more stimulus, something different or more intense. This is most commonly associated with addiction to internet pornography. And it's the reason why people who become addicted to pornography often are led into different kinds of sexual deviant behavior. Nevertheless, this is true of any type of pleasure. And once we become accustomed to receiving pleasure, we'll seek it in different forms. That's why St. Thomas says that gluttony and lust go together. They are the two most natural pleasures, the two most intense, and the two we have to be the most cautious about, and they go hand in hand. The body starts demanding some type of pleasure. So happiness is caused by the possession of something good, and there are levels of happiness. I have a form of happiness when I'm eating my bowl of ice cream. That's why St. Thomas says pleasure is one of the remedies for sadness. So when a, a, a child is lost or something, a policeman gives a child candy. But because of our fallen human nature, we tend to go overboard. Any excess in eating or drinking is then detrimental to my physical and spiritual health. Moreover, too many pleasures naturally make one very self-centered. The demands of the body overwhelm the individual. That is why those struggling with addiction often withdraw from family and friends. It's the same way with wealth. Father Thomas Dubay says that they who abound in material goods are stimulated for shorter periods of times, but the stimulation soon leads to satiety, boredom, consequent emptiness, and sometimes disgust. The worldly man takes it for granted that the more they can multiply experiences and accumulate possessions, the more they shall be filled with contentment. They so want to believe that, that they discount a constant stream of evidences to the contrary. Boredom at parties, hangovers, heartburn, after overeating, after effects of drug abuse, emptiness after loveless sexual, account sexual encounters, failure to find fulfillment in fine fashions or expensive excursions, 
make it abundantly clear that sense pleasures are not joy. Money does enable one to abound in sense pleasures, but deep down, anybody who honestly evaluates their interior sentiments knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that these sense pleasures do not bring them happiness, and, there's, and that there's something very fundamentally, very fundamental that's missing in their lives. So St. John of the Cross had it right when he said that the more a person rejoices over something outside of God, the less intense will be his joy in God. I would not be going too far to say that the capacity to experience joy is in proportion that one is stripped of all self-centeredness. That is why all those who have, been, who have generously given up their life for God feel genuine joy, whether it be the cloistered monk in a fervent monastery or the family that centers his life around God. The joy in the lives of the saints are the most eloquent witness that the world has it all wrong. The New Testament teaches a hard road and a narrow gate. One must forget about self in order to find self. One must strive to love instead of seeking to be loved. Selfless love is the principle of joy. This is absurd to worldly people, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. Millions of people have sought happiness and sense pleasures and have been disappointed, and then afterward found true happiness in serving our Creator. St. Augustine was one of them. After his conversion, he said, They'd have I loved you. You have blazed forth with light, and have put my blindness to flight. I have tasted you, and I hunger and thirst after you. Now, no one has the right to contest this experience unless they, too, have experienced both. Only one who has experienced sense pleasures and underwent a conversion can speak about both in the most profound sense, that is, from personal experience. Often, I will be talking to people and they'll say that recently they made their first good confession after being away from the church for many years. And I know I can say, and you feel great, right? And they say, yeah. And I, I, I say, oh, you feel better than you have in many, many years, right? They say, yes. I say, you know what life's about now, right? And they always say, yes. You know, the catechism says man was made for communion with God and what he finds is happiness. So that's the only way you'll be happy. It's an ontological fact of reality. So I tell them, you keep saying your rosary, go to Mass as often as you can, I promise you that you'll be happy forever in this life and in the next. So what's the message to leave to you? If you have experienced the conversion, a deepening of your union with God and with His corresponding joy, be grateful because you have received the greatest gift in the world. If you haven't, pray for the grace to make a good confession. I promise you that you too will be on the road to experiencing the joy that no one can take away. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.